Steve Clemens. I direct the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation, and we're looking forward to having a very, very interesting discussion about broad Middle East issues, but of course also in Israel-Palestine. Um, I know many of you uh, and have been here many times, but there are some new faces here today. And we are very actively engaged, uh, as, as many of you know, in just trying to figure out the Rubik's Cube uh, of, of not only the Middle East, but Israel-Palestinian uh, issues. And, and to that end, uh, one of the, the moves we made uh, a year and a half ago was to bring Daniel Levy, uh, who's just an extraordinary force uh, in trying to sort of figure out what the uh, uh, calculus is to get various sides and various places and dimensions organized towards a stable and peaceful solution uh, in Israel-Palestinian uh, relations and eventual, eventual Palestinian statehood um, in a way that doesn't sacrifice um, Israeli security interests. Um, I've been drawn deeply in this. Daniel has become one of my closest friends. We've just returned from a trip to Israel just a couple of weeks ago, um, and, I, and I have to say I came back both heartened and uh, distressed. More heartened than distressed, but, but to some degree we were there just on the eve before uh, much of this new turmoil in Gaza uh, had, had broken out. And uh, we're honored and privileged to have with us the former foreign minister of Israel, uh, Shlomo Benami. Um, Shlomo is sort of like a slightly older version of Daniel Levy. Uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, if I may uh, be so bold. But Shlomo, I've gotten to know in a virtual way, largely through his writing, in Haaretz, uh, there was an issue re recently uh, of the, of the uh, American prospect focused on the Middle East. Uh, he's been writing in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, he has a, uh, uh, I knew I was going to mix it up, a new book out, which I wish I had in front of me, but we've been handing them out over the last day. I, I want to say Wounds of War, Scars, scars of, of Peace. War, uh, of yeah, Scars of War, Wounds of Peace. <laughs> um, flipping those around, Scars of Wounds. You know, I'm not a real believer in, in uh, uh, peace, as I keep saying, it's my, it's my new line. Um, I'm a believer in equilibrium and achieving equilibriums. <laughs> and we don't have an equilibrium in the Middle East today. We don't have an e equilibrium in Israel-Palestine issues. We don't have a, uh, a broad equilibrium as I believe we used to uh, in the Middle East. And I, and I think America is facing a problem where the equilibrium it had helped try to contribute to globally has been thrown off. And the sort of tectonics of you know, interest movements, transnational movements, and state movements are very much in flux. And it's in this environment where people are trying to uh, uh, come back to terms with strategies that it get, get us back to some sort of not only stability, but a stability that I think has elements of self-determination, elements of uh, what I would be hope um, uh, uh, liberty and whatnot as part of them. But, but frankly, the kind of picture we see uh, just out of Gaza in the last few hours uh, is very, very distressing. But without further editorial comment from me, at least at this point, let me introduce Shlomo Benami, who is currently Vice President of the Toledo International Center for Peace, uh, which seeks to contribute to the prevention and resolution of violent or potentially violent international or international conflicts and to the consolidation of peace um, or equilibrium uh, within a framework of respect and promotion of human rights and democratic values. He is, of course, former Foreign Ministry of Israel. Uh, he has been meeting, and I won't go into them, but meeting with very senior level uh, members of the, of the U.S. government, the U.S. Congress, and I've been fortunate to participate in those meetings. He has very, very thoughtful uh, ideas on how to approach the region as a whole, uh, but also specifically notions uh, that I think are very important about a, how to get to a credible ceasefire and what to do with it once you and if you achieve it. Uh, he's the former Minister of Public Security uh, for the Government of Israel, and he led the peace negotiations with the PLO under former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. So without further ado, uh, please help me welcome former Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben-Ami. You didn't mind the Daniel Levy comment. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this might be the last time we use it. What that. I wanted to say is that he, he is a younger version. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very generous introduction. Uh, it occurs to me that uh, I could uh, uh, open here the discussion with uh, uh, an introduction to the essentials of uh, the Middle East situation as I see them. Uh, you know that traditionally in Israel uh, there were two schools, two strategic schools. 
when it comes to addressing the problems of uh, the inner circle of the, of the conflict and the outer circle of the conflict, that is, uh, Iran, Iraq, and, uh, and the rest of it. Uh, the right normally uh, um, addressed, wanted to address first the issue of the broader Middle East. That is, we will be able to, to make, uh, Sharon used to say, we'll be, we'll be able to make the, the, the painful concessions to the Palestinians once the Middle East is stabilized and the rogue states uh, have been uh, neutralized. That's, uh, that, that has been a traditional view of the right. The left uh, believed uh, in the centrality of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation and the need to solve it as an introduction to uh, uh, the stability of the wider Middle East. That was what brought uh, Rabin uh, to Oslo, and that was what uh, brought us to him, David. The belief that any concession that we will be making to Arafat was, in a way, a concession to the totality of the Arab world and a way uh, to reach out to the wider, to the broader, to the broader Middle East. Now, the two ways one needs to admit, if we see that from the perspective of today, the two ways failed. That is, we tried direct negotiations um, in the so-called Oslo process, and we did not come up with an agreement. But the second way also failed, mm. the attempt to uh, reconstruct, reconstruct the broader Middle East, to use uh, uh, a term that, uh, that um, was used here during the war in Iraq, uh, the need to create a new Middle East in the broader uh, area, so as to create the conditions for stability, for the end of uh, uh, wild behavior of rock states, and then we might be able to solve the wider issues of the Middle East. That also failed. The Iraq war did not usher in an Israeli-Arab peace, and uh, Iran is still uh, an open file. And then Sharon came out with a third way. Sharon, uh, perhaps the key to his popularity, uh, was that he, uh, he understood that the Israelis were uh, fed up of uh, the territories. They thought that territories are a burden on the, on the national uh, economy, on, the, on our uh, moral position in the world, and we need to get rid of it. But at the same time, the Israelis didn't want to negotiate. That is, he understood that uh, they want to get rid of the territories, but do not want to negotiate because they do not trust the partner. And they don't really believe in the, uh, in the equation of land for peace. This is how he came, with, uh, uh, he came up with uh, the, a new equation, land for security, through unilateral disengagement. Since we do not want to stay in the territories, and we do not want to negotiate, the, the, the option that is left, let us disengage unilaterally. The third way also failed. That is, it is very clear that it didn't work. We see a state of uh, war in Gaza. There are those, of course, who criticize also the unilateral withdrawal from Lebanon, although that particular withdrawal was not meant to be unilateral. The, the, the essential idea there was to reach a settlement with, with the Syrians and through a peace with Syria to stabilize Lebanon and withdraw from Lebanon. But once uh, the, the, the channel with the Syrians did not produce, we decided to withdraw unilaterally in May 2000. And the result was, again, that the international border that was established was not observed, was not respected, I need to admit, by both sides. Because one thing is the, the, uh, the attacks of uh, Hezbollah, the, the abduction of soldiers, and other is, is Israel's overfly over Lebanon, and different issues that still are pending between Israel and Lebanon. That is at least the perception, of course, of the, of the Lebanese side. So we are stuck. We are in a cul-de-sac. We are in a blind alley. Whatever we tried failed. It may be that we are not uh, that proficient in the art of negotiations, and there are better negotiators. Normally, the best negotiator is the one that does not participate in the negotiations because he knows all the tricks and what should be done. 
But I think that the whole process has been throughout a process of trial and error. And whatever was tried failed. I think that when you have a joint enterprise like negotiations and the peace process, the, 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 the decent thing is to say that both sides share the responsibility, share the burden of responsibility. I don't believe in, the, in, in a unilateral story in, uh, in, 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 the, in this uh, complex tapestry of, uh, of Israeli-Palestinian talks and Israeli-Syrian talks. Now, there has been also, uh, within this uh, uh, um, strategic, uh, uh, two, two strategic schools, there has been another one, perhaps uh, A, B, and then A1. A1 is uh, a view that was uh, backed by Rabin at the beginning. And in fact, it was invented by, it was invented by Begin. And then Rabin uh, inherited it, and later on, uh, Barak and Netanyahu. And that view is, yes, indeed, we need to address the inner circle, not uh, Iraq and Iran. But within the inner circle, we need to prefer a deal with states, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, not with the Palestinians. That is not the high priority. And why it is not the high priority? Because uh, the Palestinian issue is extremely complicated, perhaps even insoluble. So we need to have peace agreements with the states, the Arab states surrounding the Palestinian territories, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, so as if we are unable to solve the Palestinian problem, the Palestinian problem will not trigger a regional war because it will be encapsulated within a set of peace arrangements between Israel and its immediate neighbors. Rabin did not have any intention when he started the negotiations to have uh, um, a deal with Arafat on, uh, on a Palestinian state. <coughs> he wanted a deal with, uh, with Syria. Therefore, I would say that the main responsible for the Oslo Accords was Hafez al-Assad. Had Rabin reached an agreement with Syria, I trust that that would have been the main thing that he would have done during his term, not two peace processes at the time. So that was, again, another view. Today, in the Israeli government, you see that uh, 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 difference of opinion uh, between the prime minister and the, and the defense minister. The defense minister is not very fond of the Annapolis process. He would like to see Israel negotiating with the Syrians. So s Israel st is still oscillating between different options as to what is the best, the best way to break the deadlock in the Israeli-Arab uh, Arab situation. Now, I think that since everything else <laughs> fell, failed, maybe we should try to combine and see the Middle East as connected vessels, that you cannot really reach a settlement with the Palestinians by discarding totally the Syrians. Why? Because they have a leverage, because they can be spoilers, because they control, uh, uh, they have some control on Hezbollah, because they have some control on Hamas. And you cannot reach a settlement between Abu Mazen and uh, Prime Minister Olmert, uh, President Abu Mazen and Prime Minister Olmert, while the main actors, Hezbollah, I say the main actor because these actors represent authentic, genuine forces in Palestinian society that are the democratic majority. And to run today a peace process that does not take into account Hezbollah seems to me, sorry, Hamas, seems to me uh, uh, not an extremely wise way to go about it. Precisely because they are they can be spoilers. And because what you have today in Palestinian society is the emergence of new forces that did not exist there when the Oslo process started, new generations from the inside 
that do not uh, respect the leadership of the Tunisians, those who came from the outside, and are not exactly uh, um, um, popular. They are not exactly uh, enjoying of much, much credibility among uh, uh, the, the Palestinians. And therefore, an, an agreement with Mr. Abu Mazen uh, is a technical paper that it is very difficult to see how he can legitimize it in a society that is fragmented the way the Palestinian society is fragmented, in a, in a, in a setup where those who won the elections are not privy, are not part of the negotiations, how are you going to uh, legitimize that? So I, I, I believe that the text of the agreement between Israelis and Palestinians is doable. You can reach a text, but more important is the context. How are you going to sell it? Because we have a number of texts. Text. We have uh, Taba, we have <coughs> we have uh, Geneva, we have all kinds of uh, non-official papers, but they are documents. Are we going to produce another text that will not be assumed by Palestinian society and by Israeli society, but especially now by Palestinian society, given the fragmentation and the lack of legitimacy that the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian leadership has? In the Palestinian territories, the we had elections that uh, brought about uh, uh, the, the um, presidency of uh, Abu Mazen. He is a perfectly legitimate leader, democratically speaking. But they need to, 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 uh, to, to, to underline and emphasize that given the state of Palestinian society today, the revolutionary legitimacy of people like Marwan Barghouti or the heads of militias is no less important and perhaps even more important to legitimize an agreement than the democratic legitimacy of Abu Mazen. I'm saying something which is not very easy to say, but this is the reality. He will need a person like Marwan Barghouti to help him legitimize a deal. He will, he will need to uh, co-opt Hamas into the process if he wants a, legit a legitimate deal. And if we speak of Hamas, we speak, of course, of the supporters of Hamas in the region, including Syria. If we want the Syrians to, to st stop being the spoilers of any potential arrangement in the region, we need to engage them. And so far, the way whereby we say to the Syrians, like we say to Hamas, and like we say to the Iranians, mutatis mutandis, first accept these preconditions. The Iranians need to stop enriching, and then we'll talk to them. Hamas needs to accept three conditions, which, is, which they are very and surprisingly very adamant to accept. Recognize Israel, uh, accept uh, uh, previous uh, agreements, uh, stop violence, etc. And uh, we are asking the Syrians to disengage from Iran, to stop supporting Hezbollah, and uh, uh, stop supporting the terrorist organizations that they have, uh, that, that have heaven in, uh, in Damascus. I wish they would accept these preconditions, but they are, not accept they are not willing to accept them. They might accept them as the outcome of the negotiations, not as a precondition to the negotiations. So we need to decide what is the best way to save the current process of Annapolis. And the best way, in my view, is to develop a process that is inclusive. The two-state solution is being supported today or by the three most hated elements among the Palestinians. Israel, uh, Abu Mazen, and the Bush administration. These are the three legitimizers of the two-state solution. I wish it would have been otherwise, but this is the case, that the two-state solution, as the Prime Minister of Israel said recently, is the only recipe that we have in order to save the Jewish state from perdition. But this is a window of opportunity 
that we cannot miss. And I think we need to commend the, 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 the Bush administration for trying the Annapolis process, because it is really the last opportunity that we have. The two-state solution is losing its popularity among the Palestinians. They have been in this process since 1993 with no results. Israel has become in these years a booming economy <coughs> and the Palestinians have been in a constant decline. They don't see the fruits of this process. They, they, they got many promises about the future, about the two-state solution. They didn't materialize. And they have lost, they have lost trust in that possibility. Therefore, if we want a two-state solution, we need to conceive ways to change the context so that the text of the agreement will be accepted, will be legitimized, will be assumed, will be absorbed by the, by, by, by the um, uh, two societies. And in that sense, I thought that we should start first by calming down Gaza, by having in Gaza a ceasefire. And again, I can notice, maybe I am wrong, but I can notice a slight change in the attitude of the, of the Bush administration to the idea of engaging even if indirectly and implicitly Hamas in order to have a ceasefire in Gaza because they understand that Gaza can undermine Annapolis and without a ceasefire in Gaza, Annapolis is doomed. One cannot think of uh, Abu Mazen continuing negotiations with Israel while Israel is, for example, invading Gaza and staying in Jabalia in the refugee camps for, for, for several months. It will, it will not work. This is why we need to calm down um, uh, Gaza. And uh, a group of Israelis and Palestinians, we proposed this in, in, the <coughs> in the Toledo Center that was mentioned earlier in the introduction, we thought of a, a set of ideas how to, how to <coughs> reach a settlement, we presented it to, to the defense minister in Israel and uh, to different actors. And it seems to me that uh, we need to engage uh, or to remove the veto that was imposed on Abu Mazen in order to negotiate with Hamas. I am aware that there are, that there are authentic forces in Fatah, in uh, Abu Mazen's party, that are not very friendly to the idea of negotiating with Hamas. And nonetheless, there is an Israeli and an American position that serves as a pretext for these people and uh, 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 is seen by, by Abu Mazen as a veto not to negotiate with Hamas. It is my view that when a society is split between radicals and moderates, it is up to that society to solve the internal divide. And external forces normally make it worse if they intervene. This is what we try to do in Lebanon, and you can see the results. So it is up to the Palestinians to solve the internal divide. And we should empower uh, Abu Mazen to negotiate with Hamas a ceasefire. He should deliver to Hamas something that Hamas is today keenly interested in, a ceasefire. They want a ceasefire because they want to stabilize and consolidate the rule in Gaza. They cannot deliver on stability in Gaza without a ceasefire, and Abu Mazen cannot deliver on peace without a ceasefire in Gaza. So there is a common interest. We should also engage in a different way, the Egyptians. Um, Secretary Rice uh, uh, believes, and I think that uh, she's right in believing, or at least hoping, that the envelope of Arab states surrounding Israel-Palestine will be helpful in bringing the parties to an agreement, to a peace agreement, 
by exerting influence, perhaps pressure, on the Palestinians to assume positions that can be conducive to an agreement. I think that that is something that should be expected. But our experience is that it doesn't happen, that the Arab world surrounding the Palestinian-Israeli situation will not be very forthcoming in trying to twist arms, in saying to the Palestinians, you need to accept this or that position. At best, they would encourage them and support them while, once they have taken a position. This is my experience. If they have changed their behavior, the pattern of behavior, I'd be very happy. I'm not sure it will happen. <coughs> but they will act only when this is a, 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 a keen interest, a vital interest uh, of national security. And this is the case of Gaza. When the Egyptians know that there is a problem of national security, they know how to act. They do it with the Muslim Brotherhood. This is vital for stability. They do it, and they do it successfully. In Gaza, their performance is less edifying. Why? I don't think that this is because they don't want to do it in the, in the border between Israel and, uh, and, and Gaza. I think that the Philadelphia <coughs> corridor is uncontrollable, not only by the Egyptians, also by the Israelis. We were there 40 years. And arms were smuggled. And this formidable force that emerged in the form of Hamas emerged while we were in Gaza, because we could not control Philadelphia. That is, and again, Israel would not accept a ceasefire, and rightly so, would not accept a ceasefire if the ceasefire serves for the further Hezbollahization of Hamas, that Hamas becomes a Hezbollah-like force with arms smuggled through Philadelphia constantly. So blocking Philadelphia is key to, st to stability in Gaza and key to the Annapolis process. So that corridor is very, very important. If you want a ceasefire, that will say help, help give a chance to, to Annapolis. This is why the Egyptians need to perform better. But again, I say that the problem is not the quality of the performance, is the incapacity to control Philadelphia. And we propose in our plan that a sterile zone be created south of Philadelphia, that is circumvent Philadelphia. Otherwise, the Israelis will do it on the, on the, on the Palestinian side by invading the northern part of Philadelphia and controlling uh, uh, the, the, the smuggling of weapons through, that is from the Palestinian side. So it is better to have the Egyptians control the access to Philadelphia by creating a, 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 a sterile zone outside the Egyptian Rafah. You should know that Philadelphia, in fact, divides uh, Palestinian villages. Ra there is a Palestinian Rafah and there is a, an Egyptian Rafah, and these tunnels ca come, come from the houses of the same families on the Rafah on the Rafah side, on the Egyptian side, and to the Palestinian side. So I think that. This is a, a mechanism that we have developed with uh, some military experts, and we believe that uh, this is the only way, technically speaking, militarily speaking, that can uh, um, give to the Israelis a rationale to accept a ceasefire with, uh, with Hamas. Now, such a ceasefire needs to be seen, in my uh, humble uh, opinion, as the as the beginning, as, as uh, 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 a situation that might unleash a process leading to the gradual incorporation of, uh, of Hamas into the wider, uh, the wider peace process. A last word about it. You know that throughout history, we have seen that national movements need to split if they want to reach the promised land. It happened throughout history. If national movements that almost invariably have a radical wing 
and the moderate wing, if they are united, <coughs> they hardly, they can hardly reach it, the promised land because they, they neutralize each other. And it is the split that leads to the solution. A point in case is the history of Zionism. In 1947, for example, the, the Zionists accepted the partition of Palestine. If then the pragmatic wing of the national movement, led by Ben-Gurion, would have been in coalition with a radical wing led by Menachem Begin, Israel would not have accepted partition and the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948 would not have been made possible. It was precisely because of the split. And the split happened almost everywhere, the Polish national movement, the Italian national movement, the Irish national movement. That's one way to reach a settlement. But then we should be careful not to elevate this concept to the degree of a dogma. History is not a Bible. History is the, is the, is the story of the possible when, uh, uh, when uh, human societies face dilemmas. And the dilemma that we have today is that the radical wing, Hamas, is the democratic majority. Normally, the radical wing tends to be the minority. And the mainstream neutralizes the radical wing and goes ahead. This is not the case in the Palestinian society. We need to understand what is going on today in Palestine with the emergence of Islamic movements, with this young generation of uh, rebels against the incumbent regime. This is something that we see throughout the Arab world. It doesn't have much to do necessarily with the peace process. It doesn't have much to do necessarily with the peace process. It is, it is a social, political, cultural crisis of identity throughout the Arab world. And we see that this expressed also in the Palestinian territories. So are we going just to sign an agreement, a shelf agreement with Abu Mazen, and leave aside all these volcano of so social and cultural and political forces that, uh, that have emerged in the Palestinian territories over the recent years? I think it would be wrong to do so. So we need to engage them and hopefully address in that way the questions of the wider Middle East. Address the questions of the wider Middle East without uh, an Israeli-Syrian peace, stabilizing Lebanon and solving the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. And this is the last ditch attempt they are making. And one should commend them for doing that. Because if you fail now, this will be, in my view, the end of the two-state solution. So there is a lot at stake here. I believe, I believe that uh, an Israeli-Arab peace, an Israeli-Palestinian peace will have an impact also on the behavior, the regional behavior of, the, uh, of uh, the Iranian elite. I tend to believe that uh, uh, more than an enemy of the state of Israel, I'm not saying they are friends of the state of Israel, but I think that more than an enemy of the state of Israel, the Iranians are the enemies of an Israeli-Arab reconciliation. The natural enemies of Iran are to be found in the Arab world. The Islamization of the, of the Iranian discourse is a way of achieving leadership in the Islamic world. Because in an Arab world, Iran is the enemy. In an Islamic world, Iran is the potential leader. And I don't confuse radicalism with irrationality. I think that a radical regime can sometimes and frequently <coughs> is rational. I'll give you a few examples of radical regimes that can behave rationally. Libya is a radical regime that took a rational decision and abandoned its program of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein behave, behaved rationally. And the proof is that when the American forces invaded Iraq, they did not find weapons of mass destruction. So he did away with weapons of mass destruction. That was a rational decision by a radical regime. 
the Iranians behaved rationally in many phases of the recent history. A few examples. The very fact that they capitulated, they gave in to the, Iraq, to the Iraqis when they saw that this is leading to the destruction of Iran. That is, it, it was not a suicidal war. First, to begin with, it was started by the Iraqis, not by the Iranians. And then they came to a decision to give in and open a new page. In 2003, when America invaded Iraq and the Iranians found themselves surrounded and the regimes on the verge of <coughs> destruction, this is what they believed is going to happen, they tried to reach out to the Americans and propose what was then called a, a big bargain that would put on the table all the issues pending between uh, Iran and the United States, including Hamas, including the Israeli-Arab peace process, and of course, including nuclearization. So I think that rationally, there is no dispute between Israel and, uh, and, uh, and Iran. Uh, sociologists have this expression of oh, political, political scientists. Um, they have this expression of diverted mobilization, diverted mobilization. That is, you mobilize uh, the masses by diverting their attention to, to other issues. So, in fact, uh, part of the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel discourse of Iran, in my view, is a sort of diverted mobilization whereby the Iranians consolidate their position throughout the Arab and Muslim masses uh, as one additional way to protect the regime and the fact that they are a non-status quo power that would like to see a change that would take into account the new uh, uh, ground that was gained by the Iranians in recent years. So I think that uh, a, an Israeli-Arab peace is important. I'm not saying vital. I'm not saying that it solves all the problems. I, I'm not saying that it will redress the maladies of the Middle East, uh, but it would be a major contribution to uh, neutralizing the capacity of the Iranians to mobilize uh, uh, the popular masses throughout the Muslim world um, against uh, the sellout in Palestine, against the repression of the Palestinians, etc., etc. So these are a few thoughts if I um, uh, can open with you a discussion or questions or We're whatever. Have Daniel you make a couple of comments. Okay. And then thank you very much, okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, what's it here? I've asked um, Daniel, who directs our Middle East Policy Initiative and, and, and does the same with the uh, Century Foundation, to offer here just a, just a few minutes, uh, because I do want to move into to an active discussion, but just a few minutes of, of comments and, and your own take on some of these issues. Daniel? Th thank you, Stephen, and thank you very much, Shlomo, and, and it won't surprise you to, to, to hear that I I find myself in very much in agreement with, with sh the outline that Shlomo gave. I'll perhaps, as my point of departure, say, well, what are the alternatives to what Shlomo was suggesting um, in terms of the here and now and the, uh, and the situation with Gaza, with the Palestinian reality on the ground? Because I think, yeah, there is always an onus on, okay, well, that, that may sound all right, but are there better alternatives? And I just list what the five options I see as being um, right now. And the first one is, is, is where we may be heading to again uh, today, which is the status quo. The status quo of ongoing low-intensity conflict between Hamas and Israel largely through Gaza, largely through the rocket attacks and, uh, and the Israeli closure on Gaza and the Israeli uh, military operations there, but a low intensity conflict that at any given moment has a propensity, uh, even a likelihood of, of, of escalating as we saw uh, a week ago. Um, either because a, a, a rocket does a, a particular damage or leads to fatalities on the Israeli side or because an Israeli action is seen as being particularly provocative. What we've seen in the last months is rules of the game. Hamas 
tends not to use the Grad rockets on Ashkelon. The other groups, not Hamas, are the ones targeting civilians. Hamas targets uh, the uh, Israeli military in the um, in the envelope around Gaza. Israel doesn't target the uh, Hamas political leadership. Israel doesn't target the symbols of Hamas governance uh, in Gaza. But of course, when you're in an escalatory cycle, those rules of the game are thrown out the window. So one option is continue as we are, in the knowledge that this can escalate and spin out of control worse than what we saw last week at any given moment. A second option, and you're all aware it's been discussed in the media, is Israel reoccupies Gaza. <coughs> um, part or all of Gaza, the option that, uh, that, that Shlomo outlined of, of the area abridging the Philadelphia corridor. Look, there's not much appetite for it, apparently, uh, on the Israeli side, and you'll, you'll, you'll be aware of the arguments against it on the Israeli side. In particular, what's the exit strategy? It, the notion that there's a military solution is not one that has much or that much traction. Of course, as a slogan, it's always nice, but in terms of a, a workable, uh, actionable plan, there are, there are real faults in this. Um, A variation on that, and the third option would be Israel reoccupies at least partially Gaza with a view to reinstituting Fatah rule in Gaza. This idea somehow that one can hand over the Gaza Strip to, to Abbas or to the forces perhaps being trained now, the Palestinian security forces being trained uh, in the West Bank and in neighboring countries. Look, there doesn't seem to be all that much, understandably so, Palestinian enthusiasm for being re-anointed Gazan leaders on the top of Israeli tanks. Um, it was tried by the Ethiopians with the Somalian transitional government without being a stunning success uh, there either. A fourth idea one sometimes hears banded around is, well, Israel will go in and then hand over Gaza, or won't even go in, to the international community. There'll be an international force under conditions of ongoing conflict that would be placed in Gaza. I, I would simply, any, anyone who's advocating that, I would simply ask them to, to, to speak to the, the Americans or the Brits or others in NATO uh, who are having a really easy time of uh, pulling together extra forces for Afghanistan and for the Afghan mission right now. Uh, apparently, the, the, the queue uh, of countries waiting to uh, move in in a conflict situation to the Gaza Strip um, is, is, is not a particularly long one. Um, and I, I say that flippantly, but I think the argument, I think there is a place and there would be a willingness in the international community to deploy, but only if it was at the request of all the parties and in conditions of a political solution, not in conditions of an imposition and a political stalemate. So that's where one comes to, to what, what, what I think is is the least bad alternative, uh, and an alternative that, that, that has a degree of attractiveness to it, which is a ceasefire, but a ceasefire package. And, 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 and I, I find the elements that, that Shlomo put out for us ver very appealing, because I think one has to understand that, that a de-escalation and a mutual cessation of fire, which we basically saw over the last days, although it's unlikely, well, it already hasn't held in the last 24 hours, uh, and I'll come on to that in a second, is only one ingredient. If it's just a stopping of fire, it won't last, mainly because two key ingredients would not have been met. One from the Palestinian Hamas Gaza side, which is if you stop fire but you maintain the siege and the closure, which from their point of view is what led to uh, at least part of the logic of the rocket attacks in the first place, then there's no deal there. No fire, but, uh, but ongoing conditions of, of, uh, uh, of a really dire humanitarian situation uh, would not be tenable. On the Israeli side, a cessation of fire, but uh, a very transparent process of, of, of what Shlomo described as the, as the Hezbollahization of Hamas, which is the, the, the building up of a Hamas military capacity significantly qualitatively different to what it is today is not something that Israel is going to be too enthusiastic about for obvious reasons. So the ceasefire package 
as opposed to a, a limited cessation of fire, has to address those elements. At a very <laughs> minimum, it has to address the elements of easing the closure on Gaza, of allowing, in effect, Hamas governance, and of do you have an answer to, to what gets in and out in terms of weapons into the Gaza Strip. There are at least three other items that could be on that menu and that would help, I think, lock in um, a, a ceasefire with greater prospects of success. One of those elements is a prisoner exchange. Obviously, there's the issue of the um, Israeli Corporal Gilad Shalit being held in the Gaza Strip. Obviously, there are prisoners who um, the Palestinians are very keen on seeing releasing. West Bank, which is maybe the Achilles heel of a whole ceasefire package. What we saw yesterday, uh, a target of convenience in, in Bethlehem, which is probably going to lead to an escalation in Gaza. Do you include the West Bank? And finally, the, the issue of a Palestinian national dialogue and Palestinian unity. I'll close, given that, I mean, I think those are the alternatives. Those are the issues that one has to address in terms of the ceasefire. I'll close with, with, a, with a couple of comments just on Annapolis. I think at least two important things happened in terms of the framing of the peace process at Annapolis, which the administration deserves significant credit for. The first is they broke the sequentialism. What I mean by that, for people who are familiar with the roadmap and the way the peace process has gone for the last several years, is the idea was, first of all, you deal with all kinds of issues on the ground, the roadmap phase one issues in the lingua franca of the peace process, settlement, expansion should end, outpost, infrastructure of terror, etc. Only when you make significant progress down that route do you begin to address the, the political issues. Do you give a political horizon? Do you have political negotiations? Annapolis broke that equation. I think it deserves credit for doing so. And I think the, the parties, and, and I would say uh, Prime Minister Olmert, deserves credit for walking down that route, which his, 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 his predecessor did not. The th second thing I think it did, which was smart, which was it, it was honest. It was, a, it was a moment of honesty in terms of how far are we going to progress if we try and deal with the minutiae issues of the day-to-day -day of occupation. In, his, in essence, Annapolis was a recognition that you will only get so much movement, and it won't be very much, on the issues of easing the closure, on the issues of settlement, even on the issues of a Palestinian capacity to dismantle the so-called infrastructure of terror. Because those things are structural, and they're to do with the, the bigger picture of the occupation and the two-state solution, and if you don't address that, you're unlikely to get much traction. So I think An Annapolis was a potential paradigm shifting moment whose potential can only be realized, I think, if one embraces the, the main message I saw uh, from, from Shlomo's remarks, which is the, uh, the inclusivity. Because, I mean, if I use your analogy, Shlomo, of national movements, I think that moment of division happened in 1988 on the Palestinian side. When, in, in 1988, the Algiers Declaration, the PLO first basically embraces a two-state solution and be begins its dialogue formally with the US. But to use the technical term, we slapped that out too long. And we didn't uh, seize that moment. And what is a more powerful narrative today on the Palestinian side is the Faustian bargain of Fatah didn't deliver. The Fatah bargain was we, we will deal no resistance, we'll negotiate with our Israeli occupiers, we'll, we'll make nice-nice with their American friends, and that will deliver a two-state solution. It doesn't, it didn't happen, and so I think we need to reconstitute the Palestinian national movement uh, as, as a partner with whom Israel can have a more, a more effective dealing. I think that's the Achilles heel. I'd like to believe that a ceasefire and the removal of a veto on a Palestinian national dialogue could address that, uh, that shortcoming in Annapolis. Um, we'll see in the coming months, and, and thank you. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> uh, I am going to go to the floor. I just want to just pose one, one quick question, but, it, but, but also just highlight this one thing just to, to Daniel, not for a long answer, but uh, you, you talk about the need to reconstitute the, the Palestinian national movement and stakeholders in that process, but, you know, the clock is ticking, and <coughs> 
not a lot of time left in this administration, and certainly the benchmarks of whether or not this will yield anything fruitful or not is, is there. And so it, it sounds grandiose at some level to talk about such a, a big affair, and uh, we know President Bush is going in May. Um, so maybe just a quick comment there. And then Shlomo, when I was at RAND, and, and, and just sort of as a strategist, one of the things we're taught to, to do is not to anticipate the best option, not to uh, invest too much in hope, uh, uh, despite Barack Obama's best efforts, um, not to think, uh, to, to, to count on the worst behavior, um, the worst outcomes, and look at what you can achieve. And if you were to anticipate and think ahead, and, I, and, and I, I almost hesitate to ask this, but let's just say you got some sort of two-state deal. You found some way to create an internal solution with Palestine, that Hamas was a part of that equation and it began to become part of it. I suppose the worst case scenario in that is that Hamas ends up being what a lot of the critics have said Hamas is, is essentially an Iran-like entity that brings in uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, terrorist uh, capability, uh, increased um, ability to strike Israel, um, you know, logistic support and background, and, 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 and sort of the, you know, you've got a, a, a virulent and, and much more empowered enemy on the border of Israel. So if you anticipate that is the worst case scenario, what, what is the uh, military and the diplomatic option at that point? Can you back up? Does Israel have a backup possibility in that case? Or, or a set of options, you know, thinking ahead, if in fact Hamas does not rise to a higher level of, of responsible behavior, um, if you're able to structure a deal that would build them into a to kind of responsible stewardship of a Palestinian state of operation. We talk a lot about the possibility of what they may do, but what, let's just say they don't do that. Does Israel still have a case in which it has options uh, in that front? Daniel and, and Shlomo, and quick options, then I'll, and then I'll start here. No, I I mean, I mean, sure, it's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination to get the Palestinian national dialogue restarted, let alone moving anywhere positive. And I think there's a serious question as to whether that is what Abbas wants at the moment. I think at least the veto should be removed on that, and then we can let the Palestinian internal politics um, play out. I would say, though, that given the time pressures, without that, I don't think one gets to the moment of truth. I think the American position is, if we get a deal, then you have conditions in which Hamas will find itself in an impossible position domestically in Palestine, and Fatah and Abbas will, will carry the day. My argument would be twofold. One, under these conditions, I don't think we get a deal. Either it gets torpedoed because of the security reality, or Abbas simply looks around and sees that no one's behind him. Because his own Fatah movement will say to him, Ya Rais, the reality right now is on the ground nothing positive has happened no one will believe in this peace agreement this agreement entails very tough compromises we can't defend this publicly so i don't think we reach the moment if we do reach the moment i don't think we'll have enough legitimacy to carry the day i think that should be a real fear of anyone who supports the two-state solution and what i'd say is steve I don't know whether it's two months or six months, but the, the moment of reality for the Annapolis negotiations isn't here yet. We're, we're in what could be called garbage time at the moment. My fear is that garbage time will stink so much to high heaven that it will asphyxiate the possibility of Annas Annapolis actually bearing fruit. Why do you two Slomo. Well, you know, I, uh, Steve, I, I, I share with you this, uh, the pessimism in your introduction about uh, you not being a believer in peace. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm serious. I, 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 I'll tell you what I mean. I, I, I do not really believe in, uh, given the nature of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, I'm not a believer in a, in a heavenly peace between Israelis and Palestinians. I think that the nature of this conflict is such that uh, you will always have, even if we sign a peace agreement with the Palestinians, you will always have a revisionist wing, especially among the Palestinians, either in, a refugee, in refugee camps in Lebanon and on the outside. Uh, and we are not going to have uh, an absolute and eternal respite from uh, terrorism. So that, that, that is my view, that I, I, I have never been 
uh, very friendly to Mr. Shimon Peres' uh, uh, lofty visions of, an, uh, of a new Middle East in the foreseeable future. <coughs> in the long run, as Keynes used to say, we'll all be dead. But, uh, but I'm talking about a, a, a reasonable uh, uh, look into the future, OK? And because of the nature, you see, Zionism is a, is a movement that has always been looking for a solution. The Palestinians have always looked for justice. And uh, because of the national Palestinian ethos, because of the nature of the, of, the, of the origins of the conflict, and in that situation, it will take a long, long time, even after we sign a peace agreement, that we are going to have everybody on board. Everybody on board. This will not happen, in my view. <coughs> To uh, to uh, complete my my non-vision, <laughs> that is, um, or my non-utopia, I I think that by making peace with the Palestinians, even though it will not be totally 100% inclusive, we will be making peace with the international community. It is very very important in my philosophy in how I see the conflict. We need to have internationally recognized borders. We are one of the only states in the planet with no internationally recognized borders. The reason that the war in Lebanon of, uh, nine, of 2006 lasted for 34 days and was the longest war in Israel's history is because Israel did not see any power in the world rush to the, to, the, to the Security Council to ask for a ceasefire. And why? Among other reasons. Because Israel was upholding an internationally recognized border. I need, I want to have the support of the international community in case the, 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 the border is violated, the border with the Palestinians. That, that, an Israeli prime minister we go down to history as the, 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 the most important prime minister in our history since Ben-Gurion if he reaches internationally recognized borders, even if Hamas or these or that wing in Fatah do not accept it. But it will be accepted by the international community. And that is a new phase in our relations with the Arab world, and indeed with the international community as well. So I think this is extremely, uh, extremely important. Now, as to whether or not Hamas will uh, work uh, along the, the script that we have uh, prepared here, well, we have we have uh, uh, an agreement that was reached between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, under the auspices of uh, the most uh, famous uh, Palestinian prisoner now, uh, Marwan Barghouti, the so-called uh, uh, um, Prisoner's Co Covenant, which is a platform for an Israeli-Palestinian deal <coughs> that Hamas people accepted. And it goes along the lines, more or less, of the Saudi Peace Initiative. Now, I don't, I, I, I don't know if Hamas as a movement will be there next time we try to engage them. I don't know, maybe they will uh, um, go into the orbit of others and not, uh, and not uh, opt for, a, for engaging in the process. But we need to try it. We need to try it because we know that the history of, of Hamas shows that there is a diminishing commitment of these organization to the core values of its constitution. First, they went into politics. Second, wherever they control municipalities in the West Bank, they collaborate with the Israeli authorities. You, you cannot be, you cannot be a mayor in a Palestinian city if you do not collaborate with the Israeli army. And they do so to provide services. In no municipality that they control, they even tried to impose the Sharia, the, the, the religious uh, uh, constitution, the religious law. So I think, and the fact that they have uh, advanced concepts such as Tahdiya, such as Hudna. I, I, I want to, re to reiterate that. I think that Hamas is a very nasty organization. I'm not trying to advocate the case of Hamas. I'm trying to see how we can have a, a deal that is as inclusive as possible, even if that means 
negotiating with Hamas. Most of the terrorist attacks that took place during the second Intifada, and even today, come from Fatah, not from Hamas. They come from the Laksa Brigade, Brigades. Hamas is a much more orderly, hierarchic organization than Fatah. And I think that we didn't give it a try to see if we can co-op them. When Olmert won the elections, I came to see him and I told him, that was before the war in Lebanon, I told him, listen, there is much more of a common ground between Israel and Hamas than between Israel and PLO. He said, how come? I told him, I'll tell you why. PLO is obsessed with the idea of a final settlement. They want an end game. Israel also wants an end game. But in my view, under your government, I told him then, is incapable to reach that. Israel wants it, but is incapable of reaching it. While Hamas doesn't want it, because he doesn't want to make the ideological concessions. So your convergence plan, I told him, can be negotiated with Hamas. The convergence plan that you had, that was <coughs> alive before the war in Lebanon, if you negotiate it with Hamas, it is in the interest of Hamas, because they, they don't want a final settlement. They are incapable of making the, the ideological leap. And you, you want a settlement, but you are incapable. You're, the, the, ma the maximum you can give to the Palestinians doesn't meet the minimum. So go for negotiation with Hamas. But then, of course, uh, the war in Lebanon, and, and, by, and by the way, then, opinion polls, then and now, opinion polls in Israel gives all, give overwhelming majority for negotiating with Hamas. Thank so you. we should try that way. Let me uh, uh, go for it. Quick questions and quick answers. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. I'm Hussein of the Arai newspaper. My question to Mr. Ben-Ami, on the Syrian track, given the strong connection between Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas, do you think the Syrians can deliver without an Iranian approval? And in return, uh, many scholars suggest that Syria wants from the peace treaty, other than the Golan, wants the scaling down of the Hariri Tribunal in Lebanon, and that could be done through the American sponsor of peace, and probably regain uh, recognition for its control of Lebanon. Can you think both sides can deliver these items? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, um, well, it's very difficult to say uh, whether we can expect that the Syrians will disengage from the Iranians in, uh, with, in a peace deal m m with Israel. Uh, I, I think that they might not uh, cut uh, the relations with the, Syri with the Iranians, but uh, uh, one would expect that these relations will be of a more benign nature than uh, they are today. That is, uh, there is a, uh, a collaboration in supporting uh, Hezbollah and uh, and um, in, in being uh, a part of this uh, Middle Eastern uh, axis of, uh, of evil, so-called axis of evil with Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Iran, and Syria. Uh, but I think that there is a, a, a one, one can see a keen interest by the Israeli side as well. I can, I can vouch for the Israelis that even the prime minister, who is very committed now to Annapolis, uh, is still looking for ways to uh, to uh, reach out uh, to the Syrians, so I think there is an interest, and somehow the formula was not uh, was not found. I I trust that uh, Israel cannot expect uh, in a peace deal with Syria that the Syrians will simply cut off relations with uh, with with the Iranians, but they they must be of a more benign nature than they are today, and that that is what 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 one could expect. I agree with you of about the centrality of the Hariri issue for the behavior of Syria in the question of the election of the president in Lebanon and, uh, and, and, and other issues. I even heard a f what seems to me a far-fetched uh, um, idea that uh, 
the Syrians were responsible for the assassination of Mughnia because that was a conspiracy with the CIA to avoid the, the, the Hariri trial. So the Hariri trial appears in different, <laughs> in different scenarios. Uh, I, I agree with you that the Hariri issue is very, very important for, uh, for the Syrians, but, th but this should not be an obstacle for opening negotiations between Israel and, 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 and the Syrians on a deal on the Golan. Thank you. Uh, Paul Chan from the Middle East Institute. Uh, a couple of comments on this your, uh, and uh, question. You set out here and in your book, which is remarkable and essential reading, a different framework and a pragmatic framework, and one that I think is essential. Uh, the problem is and that I don't see, given that you talked about the fragmentation among Palestinians, which is true, but the fragmentation in Israeli politics is just as true. We don't, we see Barack from the Labor Party seemingly insisting, at least verbally, on a military option. Uh, and Livni and uh, and Olmert are looking at the, at, uh, at PA at uh, Fatah. So, given the American passivity, we started Annapolis, but the fact that uh, talking with or even implicitly with Hamas seems to be something the United States would barely condone and certainly not push. Cheney is going there next week. I doubt that he is going there in order to uh, 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 facilitate uh, some sort of implicit dialogue with Hamas. So the question is, where will, who will bail the cat in the old uh, parable? Where will this political direction come? Uh, next year, of course, the American president is changing. Uh, the uh, uh, PA presumably will hold elections, and uh, Abu Mazen will not, will not present himself for elections. Exactly, and perhaps Barghouti, who's the only attractive candidate, will come in. But he may have spoiled himself because of all the Israelis who want to release. Uh, the Iran will have a new election. Uh, Israel may next year, and of course, most life things stay the same. Bibi is the uh, top candidate. So, where will this political direction come from? Who will? Yeah. Well, the question I think that for the camera is just where will the political direction come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that uh, you, you have been very realistic in your uh, in your question. I think that. Uh, uh, if we have one lesson from this uh, process uh, ever since it started in 1993 is that uh, the politics have killed the process on, on both sides. Uh, you know that uh, Shamir was the longest uh, serving Israeli prime minister after Ben-Gurion and the reason is that he did not touch the Palestinian problem. The, mo the moment he went to the Madrid peace conference he lost the elections. And uh, the same happened with uh, Rabin. Uh, that, his life ended tragically, but uh, one can apply to him also the same, uh, the same uh, concept. And then, then Rabin, and then Perez, and, uh, and Netanyahu, by the way, was three years prime minister, precisely because he didn't touch the, the Palestinian issue. He went to Y, he signed the Y River Plant uh, uh, Agreement, and, uh, and lost. Uh, so you are absolutely right. Uh, this functionality of the Israeli political system is as a uh, big problem as the, the fragmentation of the Palestinian polity. There is no doubt about it. And um, um, whether or not this administration will accept, uh, including Hamas, my sense is they will accept uh, uh, something that has to do with a ceasefire, but not the logic that will, un that will unleash after such a ceasefire that is an inclusive process with Hamas. The, they have here an, an ideological position that, uh, that has to do with their position in the broader Middle East, with uh, other issues. So I, I, I'm not optimistic. That is, if there is no change here, the parties may produce a paper, may produce a paper. Uh, I'm not saying it will be totally irrelevant uh, because, uh, well, it will be a paper reached between two governments and, and uh, and this is more important than uh, than the Clinton peace parameters. The Clinton par peace parameters are an American bridging proposal. That the, the, this is not an agreement between two, two governments, however weak and however uh, uh, unpopular. 
Okay? So I think that I, I'm not uh, uh, underestimating the importance of the paper. Um, I, I, if I w w would, uh, were in a, in a, in a, in a res position of responsibility, I would have strived to have this document uh, endorsed by the, by the Security Council, that is, as the internationally accepted interpretation of what 242 is. Uh, and I, I think you can, you can walk some mileage with, with, with such a paper, but it will, it will fail in, uh, to be applied on the ground because of this fragmentation if we don't uh, uh, turn it into an inclusive process. Barghouti is a, is a very... Uh, uh, a positive element in all these talks. W whenever you meet people that see him, I I, uh, I met uh, recently a very good friend of uh, well, uh, everybody is uh, that is the tragedy of this uh, Palestinian Israeli situation. We are all so, so good friends of each other. Uh, I, I have known Barghouti in, in in Copenhagen in in in, in the late. Uh, 80s when we we started a sort of process with uh, with, the, with the Palestinians and then I worked with him in some backtrack in the mid uh, in the mid 90s and uh, he is what uh, for the Palestinians is peace now I mean somebody that in, 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 in the Palestinian Authority uh, that says that he wants the border of 67 the vision of Jerusalem and the decent solution to the problem of refugees is the Palestinian peace now this is what Israel is uh, now that we have Hamas we understand the the the, 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 theo the theory of uh, relativity. Uh, so I think uh, um, and Barghouti, I think that uh, can be a legitimizer of such an agreement. Uh, uh, he needs to be released. I have a very very intelligent uh, 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 Palestinian friend who says that if he is released, the best that you can do is send him abroad. Don't let him stay in Palestine, because he will be he will be killed politically by the petty politics of the of Ramallah. So send him to uh, to Beirut or somewhere else to become a reference uh, for 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 the two state solution. But anyway, I think that he's he's vital given the the, the situation right now. Let me uh, yeah. move to Trita Parsi for a moment, but before I do, just, just a couple of words on Ehud Barak. Does he, oh. Can he be counted on to be responsible and not be a spoiler uh, if, if Olmert's government does pull around? I mean, because he looks when, from outside, he looks like a guy who's not. When, on I, the la same when I last saw him uh, two weeks ago, uh, he, he, I asked him. Uh, what is going on with the peace process? He said, well, Livni is conducting a seminar with Abu Allah on, on the core issues. <laughs> but he looks like he's trying to break their back domestically with some of these issues. Is that, is it, do, do I have an incorrect no, I think that you, No, I think that uh, maybe we are reading too much into his, uh, his personal frustration. I mean, he, uh, frustration which I share, <laughs> that uh, uh, we didn't reach a settlement during our, uh, our term in office. And uh, he took it perhaps more seriously than I did. I, uh, and and uh, he has uh, distanced himself from the peace process in a way that uh, it's difficult to understand uh, because you, you sort of uh, um, uh, impose your feelings and frustrations on the political, on the political situation. And uh, he needs to understand, this is what I told him two weeks ago, he needs to understand that the, the, the constituency, the labor constituency, is going to, uh, to leave him in favor of, uh, of Olmert. In fact, the reason that Olmert is gaining in the opinion polls is precisely because he's in Annapolis and, 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 and the labor party constituency is not very happy with the attitude of labor to the, to the peace process. So even if for political reasons, he needs to, uh, to position himself in a different, uh, in a different <coughs> way. But again, if they reach a settlement, uh, it, 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 it is really uh, most disturbing one, when one thinks of it, that the labor party is totally, totally uh, 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 separated and, and, uh, and dissociated from the process. Yeah, this is the party that has carried the process from 1993, and today they are in government, and none of them is involved even collaterally in, uh, in, uh, in the process. So I, th I thought that this is a, a, a wrong political uh, uh, decision, and uh, they would be losing support among the, the natural constituency of labor. I told him, if uh, Olmer succeeds, he will succeed. If he fails, Bibi will gain, not you. Mm. So the, Bibi is the real alternative in that sense, if, uh, if, if Annapolis fails. So what, what political sense does your opinion make? 
Interesting. Trita, and then right here. So, well, thank you so much for a very good presentation. Um, I have a question for you in regards to where Israel stands right now in its views about Iran and U.S.-Iran relations. We've seen uh, significant frustration from Israel, particularly from certain individuals in Israel, in regards to the NIE. And at the same time, we see here in the United States that the political climate is changing. We're having an election in which some candidates are running on the ticket, arguing in favor of dialogue, which is quite unprecedented. How do you think Israel would react to those elements in Israel? Um, has these elements come to a certain term that perhaps this is inevitable, and in, under these circumstances, if a dialogue between the United States and Iran were to take place, would Israel perhaps come out in support of it in hope that its concerns would be considered in that dialogue? Or do you think it is still stuck in a place in which it views any type of development in that direction as highly negative for Israel? So for the camera, Trita Parsi's question is about Iran relations. Do you, see, do you see such a dialogue opening under this administration? No, no. 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 In, the in, the, in, the, in the next yeah. administration. Well, I, I think that uh, um, Israel was, uh, uh, will take it very, very hard. So, uh, will take very hard such a dialogue, in my, in my sense, unless uh, this is a dialogue that will open uh, within, within the, um, the context of uh, a, a tacit uh, agreement that exists between Israel and the United States on a different issue of no surprises. That is, if there is a previous coordination, you know, there is an agreement between Israel and, and, and the United States when it comes to the Palestinian issue and negotiations with, with an Arab partner, no surprises. You need to coordinate things with us before. So if there is a, a, a concept uh, that is uh, uh, talked about with the Israelis uh, and explained in a way that the Israelis can digest it, I guess that, uh, um, that uh, since the, the military option, if under this American administration does not materialize, it is very difficult to believe that it will materialize under uh, uh, another uh, uh, um, um, administration. In that sense, uh, once you do not have uh, a military option on the on the on the table, uh, then uh, Israel might be uh, might be uh, coaxed into accepting that the alternative is to engage and include Iran in some sort of uh, of regional deal. I, I think that again, if it comes as a as a as a boom, as a, as a supersonic boom, as a surprise, this will be a major crisis for in terms of Israel. But if there is a, a dialogue between the two parties and try to understand how we, we reshape the relations in that part of the world, I think that uh, Israel might accept it. Jim. We haven't talked at all about settlements, but I'm curious about, I mean, you talk about the necessity of going to sort of final negotiation to get out of the minutia of the occupation and you can go right to the sort of existential issues, evacuation of the West Bank settlements, Jerusalem, et cetera. Um, yet, you know, having just returned from there and, and talking to peace now and going to the West Bank and seeing the settlements continue to expand, I'm curious, you know, when that, when that moment of truth comes, the settled movement strikes me and the people I talk to as still being very, very powerful. I'm curious of your views, both panelists. Well, I think it is a major problem uh, that if we reach a settlement uh, on paper and then we go about uh, implementing it, and uprooting uh, and removing uh, masses of, of settlers and settlements in the, in the Palestinian heartland. I'm not talking about uh, the blocks of settlements that would require uh, territorial swaps. Uh, you will have a very serious crisis, uh, which is another reason why uh, uh, um, a leader like Barak needs to be coordinated with Ehud Olmert, uh, precisely because of his uh, military uh, record and. Uh, uh, he doesn't suffer himself from, from an excess of charisma, but uh, he, he at least uh, has, a, has a, m a military pedigree uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is very important. He is today the Sharon of the left, in a way. But uh, Sharon managed to become uh, a popular figure. Uh, Barak is still a long way. But he can be very, hel very helpful in, uh, uh, in that if he, if he works uh, with the prime minister. But I agree that we are uh, removing uh, settlers in, uh, in Kiryat Arba, in Hebron. Uh, that is going to be a major, major internal crisis that would require a wide consensus. And again, 
that, 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 that is very important to note. You, you will have such a wide consensus in Israel if the notion, the sense that the Israelis will have is that they did not sign an agreement just with the sheriff of Ramallah. That, that on the other side there is uh, uh, somebody that can deliver. Because otherwise they will say, why should I uh, remove your settlements if on the other side we don't have somebody that can, uh, that can legitimize <coughs> the agreement uh, for his people. So wherever you see it, you, the, the process needs to be as, as uh, inclusive as possible. But uh, the, se the settlement issue is, uh, is a major problem. And the, what you saw, that settlements are expanding, that's again one of the problems of the, of, of the dysfunctionality of the political system. You have today a, 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 a government where you have Kadima, Labour, Shas, and the Prime Minister promised Shas that uh, he will not negotiate Jerusalem now. When I met him last time, I told him, that's a problem. If you don't put, if you don't put Jerusalem on the table, you will not have, you will not have a package. Because you need quid pro quos. You need, they will need to know what are they getting in Jerusalem in order to see if they can make a concession on another topic. So that, that, that's a whole tapestry that you need to, to, to have a balance within all the components. And, uh, but he can't do this because of Shas. And again, and because of Shas, he needs to allow all kinds of things in um, building in Jerusalem, etc. Uh, the only, when, when we face a similar solution, we say to ourselves that, okay, this is the price we pay for uh, maintaining the coalition. But the moment we reach a settlement, everybody knows that uh, we can bring down the wall. What we did in Sinai, that we, uh, uh, that we removed the uh, air bases, settlements, it, we had precedents. That is, there is a precedent, and when there is a peace deal, when, you, when there is an end game inside, when there is an American commitment, we are able to undo things that we did during the years of occupation. And we saw it in Sinai. And we saw it in Gaza. So it is doable. It is doable. But you need leadership. You need consensus. And you, and you need a sense that you have signed an agreement with somebody that I'm going to sacrifice my internal unity. I'm going to split, divide the nation, perhaps on the verge of civil strife. But I need to know that on the other side, it's not only Abu Mazen and Abu Allah and Saeed Barakat. Okay? Daniel, a uh, very quick response on the settlement issue. No, I've not, I've not got much to add to what Shlomo said. The uh, Gaza proved the egg could, could be unscrambled. Um, my, my feeling about <coughs> settlement expansion <coughs> Uh, other than certain, uh, the envelope around Jerusalem, which I think is, is seriously damaging to, to the prospects of a two-state solution, it's less the new facts being created on the ground. It's more the, 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 what it does here in, in people's heads, especially on the Palestinian side. I think the erosion in the belief of a two-state solution that continued settlement expansion uh, <coughs> it, it encourages is, is, is one of the biggest problems we face. Jim, can I just want to add like, one element on this settlement issue. When we were in uh, uh, Israel recently ourselves and met a good number of Knesset members from across the political spectrum, um, everyone that, that we spoke to uh, we, we walked in, you know, Akiva Eldar has this new book out, Lords of the Land, and yeah. so well, if you read it, it's a brilliant book, but you just say, settle, yeah, settlers control you. this issue. Yeah. None of the Knesset you members, not... Akiva Eldar, I yeah. have a very good friend, yeah. she's Edith. Edith Zeltal, she wrote, she's the writer of the book. <laughs> oh, she's the writer of the book? <laughs> it's it's co-authored. Oh, co-authored. It's co-authored, co but so she, uh, give, uh, she wrote the co-authored credit. Wrote credit. Yeah. Go to Amazon, it's there. But my point is that I can't tell you who said this, because it was an off-the-record meeting. But even someone who hangs a lot out a lot with Avigdor Lieberman, is that fair? Yes. Yeah. Actually said in the unusual uh, two-state solution that this person had in mind, that was very different than what was being discussed, he'd even move Lieberman out of Lieberman's uh, uh, camp. And, and so to some degree what was interesting was from a guy who's not as steeped in all of this as Shlomo Benami and Daniel Levy, I got the sense from uh, uh, Karima people, people from Shas, people from the, the, the what do you call it, Russia, Israel, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the Israel, Israel yeah, yeah. Yeah. Le Lieberman's party, that, that the notion that the settlements have some sort of determinism 
uh, in what's done is broken. And I think it's something for, for yeah. outsiders yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah. Look, uh, just a word, Steve, if yeah. you may, uh, about this. Uh, you know, some of my best friends are settlers. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I have a very good friend who, uh, it's, uh, people don't believe that he was my friend. He is my friend, Benny Elon, who is, uh, is a very interesting uh, guy. His brother is a, is a very interesting rabbi, and uh, anyway, uh, his wife, Emuna Alon, which is uh, very active uh, in the settler community, told me the other day that uh, what struck her most in the, uh, in the dismantling of the Gaza settlements was the indifference of the people. Mm. That if we were being uprooted, and uh, you know that they uprooted also cemeteries, because they had to take with them also the cemeteries. It, that was a real tragedy when you see it from that perspective. Said, she said to me, I thought that we were, as uh, Zertal and, uh, and Akiva and Darwai, the lords of the land. <laughs> and it turns out that people were totally indifferent to our plight. So that is also a message. Now, we're at the end. What, I, what I'm going to propose to do, because there are so many questions, I'm sure they're great. Um, I must go, and we all have to go on. I'm going to cluster some questions. I know Michael always has, hates this, but there's just no way around it. So uh, let me ask uh, uh, Daniel and, and Shlomo Benami to um, keep quick notes, but I do because I don't like excluding any voices. But um, please pick one of your comments of the three you've got, and let's make it all brief, okay? Uh, the gentleman in the very back. And I'd rapidity is, will be sure, re I'd rewarded. Sure, with Al <laughs> TV. Yes. We know that there's a large uh, peace movement inside Israel, and uh, the majority of Israelis support the peace process and negotiations right. and what have you. Why doesn't that translate into votes during the elections to give uh, a party or two the mandate to form a, a government and the mandate to really engage in a peace process rather than having Kadima or the Labour uh, have to uh, uh, bring in uh, extreme right parties, small parties, into their governments and, and promise them not to tackle the issues of uh, Jerusalem and what good, have good you. Good question. Why, for the camera, why doesn't uh, the, the, the political will, sympathy, etc., translate into the mechanics of government? Mike? Uh, from your perspective, Mr. Benami, when you look upon the American Jewish community, from your own perspective, and from your own hopes, goals you wish to achieve, are there things you say to yourself, I wish the American Jewish community would do more of? Or, and what are the, some things you would like to do less? So the questions of the American Jewish community, how they would like to see more or less of them? Yes, sir. Yeah. After 60 years of failure of dealing with the Palestinians, is there a chance that Israel will take a totally different approach to things that are clear that Israel has failed? in his understanding the mindsets of the Palestinians and not having an appropriate PR throughout the world to explain the difficulties and the problems which the Palestinians have done extremely well. Mm. The question is, 60 will years of failure, will there be sort of a new and different move on the, on the Israeli side with that? Uh, other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Very quickly, um, on the mechanism you mentioned, uh, I would be very interested to hear a bit more about it and uh, how you think it would work out in the area who would be doing this um, and do you see any sort of role in any sort of way for you for the MSO or that? So a brief response on the mechanism that Foreign Minister Benami mentioned. Any other quick items to include? Let's close it there. Gentlemen, uh, let me let me uh, I'll I'll just pitch it to Shlomo and any any uh, pick up <coughs> Daniel Levy. Well, the, the reason that uh, um, this um, um, yearning for peace that, uh, that is there, obviously, nobody wants a state of war, and, uh, is, uh, uh, does not translate itself in, into political terms in elections, uh, is twofold. Uh, one is uh, that over the years, because the, the, the process did not deliver, uh, we, we saw developing in people's mind uh, the, uh, an indifference, a, a, a lack of uh, belief that this is at all feasible and, and, and possible. Uh, everybody tried. Uh, now we, ha we are being led by lesser figures. Uh, the, 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 the bigger figures did not succeed. How come this will, I mean, who is Olmert after all? He was a mayor of Jerusalem. He came from Likud. So I think that there is a sense that 
okay, they will negotiate, but it will come to nothing. That is a very widespread feeling, one needs to, to admit. The second reason is that uh, uh, elections in Israel uh, have been throughout uh, a, a, a cultural clash more than a, more than a political clash. That is, uh, Israel is fragmented into ethnic and uh, religious and, uh, and political uh, families. Um, we, you know, the dream of the, the of the new Israeli that uh, that uh, was <coughs> was advanced by the founding fathers has become into uh, multiple uh, uh, faces of Israelis. You have uh, the Arabs that will vote for their parties. You have the Russians that will vote uh, for cultural and identity issues. This is th these are the politics of identity that are very very strong. We see them here in the primaries in, uh, in the United States in some way, in the democratic primaries. The, 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 uh, so it, it is very, very strong, and they overshadow the, 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 the big national issues. How else can you understand the fact that in the middle of the Intifada, in the middle of the, of the struggle for, to find a political way out, suddenly you have eight Knesset members of pensioners? What the hell? Why? <laughs> we are talking about life and death. No, the, the, the eight Knesset members, which is, I uh, know, 7% of the Knesset. And a few years earlier, again, in the middle of the Intifada, 15 anti-clerical uh, Knesset members, because anti-clericalism is an issue. So I think that people do not uh, behave politically only on the question of the peace process, among other reasons, because the leaders did not present to them the alternatives in a, in a very robust and clear way. And second, because one needs to admit that there is an indifference that has developed over the years. OK, they will negotiate another paper, another meeting, another summit. Uh, and and this, uh, these summits and meetings take place always, always in, uh, in exotic places throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the people lost trust in the process, one needs to admit. So that's, uh, that's perhaps the way to explain it. Now, the um, uh, American Jews, Amer uh, of course, uh, uh, Israel is, uh, um, is uh, very attentive to what American J Jews uh, uh, say or, uh, or believe. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but, the, but the decisions need to be taken by the Israelis. You see, this is a major difference between uh, the, the, the the Zionist movement and the Palestinian national movement. The Palestinian, you know, they, we both had uh, uh, communities in Palestine and the diaspora, okay? But with the Palestinians, the diaspora was the focus of decision making. With us, it is Israel that is the focus of decision making, and the diaspora may be a, 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 a logistic uh, a support, but not where decisions need to be taken. And uh, over the years, we saw in Jewish communities, not only in this country, but of course in this country, uh, the, the organized Jewish community. I'm not saying Jews in general, the organized Jewish community, the institutions, uh, uh, developing a view that uh, they will support Israel uh, by supporting whatever government is in office. OK? That what the government says and believes, this is also the position. This needs to be the position of, uh, of these organizations. Now, uh, I know, I am aware that uh, uh, the, if we take the case of APAC here in, uh, in the United States, uh, there is this uh, um, notion that APAC has developed a personality of its own. That is, that it is not necessarily, that does not necessarily concur with given governments in Israel. They will not come out uh, head on against uh, an elected government of, uh, in Israel, but uh, they, they will have an agenda which is right of center, OK, or, or to the right. We should that, add very quickly, though, that interestingly, APAC does support the Annapolis process. OK, right? yeah. so that's very important. What? Because the government also is there. Uh, they cannot go against it. I was not aware, for example, that they ever came against us going to Camp David. So we need to, uh, to, uh, to put things in, in, uh, in, in perspective. 
At the end of the day, uh, I believe that uh, the um, the main issue when it comes to the so-called Jewish lobbies, etc., is is the. Of course, it is important to have a, a, a powerful uh, Jewish uh, lobby that will that will say that there are many ways to uh, to support Israel. And one way is to advance the peace process and be proactive in that. that I think this, this can be perfectly legitimate. On the other hand, I think that uh, whenever, whenever we saw an American president that was ready to take leadership and take a decision uh, for peace, uh, th there was not much a lobby could do. I mean, if you uh, take, for example, the case of uh, Bush father when he decided to go to, uh, to the Madrid Peace Conference, uh, he, he did it against uh, the, the, the Jewish lobby that at the time, the time was, uh, there was the issue of the uh, loan guarantees that uh, were, were, were promised to Israel and there was to be a vote in Congress to support the loan guarantees. The president didn't want the loan guarantees because he wanted to force Shamir to come to, to, uh, to, to the Madrid Peace Conference and the loan guarantees did not pass because this was against the, 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 the president's policy. And uh, when we negotiated with Clinton, again, I was in the middle of the negotiations. I was w in, in the most sensible places where one needed to be for these negotiations. And I never heard a Jewish voice being an obstacle to us negotiating the future of, of Jerusalem. They might have had their opinions, but they were not active in, 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 as an obstacle. I'm not, I'm not aware of that. So I think that one needs to put these things in, 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 in perspective. Now, uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, if I understand correctly, sir, what you meant is that uh, Israel is very bad in PR and trying to explain uh, why all this has failed and what is the Palestinian uh, uh, side of it, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, well, this is this is a, rec a recurrent uh, uh, topic in, uh, in 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 Israel, and uh, that we are weak in what is called Hasbara. We are weak in explaining the case, and uh, you know the. I, I I give you a personal story just to to make my point. Um, the the New York Review of Books once wrote a piece about me. There was a, 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 an article about something that I said. In, uh, in, in, in the cabinet, in the government. When Ehud Barak, uh, when the process exploded and everything was, uh, uh, was destroyed really and we, we felt that we need to make our case in the international community, he said that we need to explain to the world that the Palestinians do not abide by agreements signed. And I said, it was leaked, so it came out in, outside, I said in the cabinet, we may be right, but the problem is that if we go for such a campaign, I've, I'm afraid we are not going to be successful. He said, why? I said, because people accept that uh, a people that lives under occupation has a right to outsmart the occupier. And uh, this is exactly what we did with the British. We brought Jews to Palestine against the will of the British against the, the terms of the of the mandate of Palestine. But people understood we need to outsmart the occupier. We built an army under the eyes of the of, of the British. Uh, you still discover in uh, in in kibbutzim in Israel, uh, uh, you know, underground uh, uh, reserves of weapons that we that we piled up during the the, the British mandate because we outsmarted and outwitted the the uh, the. Um, the occupier. So, so long as this situation, that is, so long as the Palestinians haven't gone into, forgive me the, the expression, into a post-Westphalian phase, <laughs> so long as they haven't gone into a phase where they are part, they are uh, uh, in, the, in the family of nations, uh, a state, a nation, internationally recognized, it is difficult to ask of them what you ask let me, you can ask for, 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 uh, for Hasbara reasons, but I am afraid it will not convince. I'm afraid it will not convince. So, uh, you know, uh, when, whenever Bibi Netanyahu comes to the United States and speaks and people say, how good he is in Hasbara, I want him to go to Yemen and explain this in Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> in America, it's not final, difficult to explain. Final comment? <laughs> on, final comment on the uh, 
anything related <laughs> to the mechanism. <laughs> Shlomo, any uh, final comment on this question of the mechanism? And then we'll... Oh, we'll sorry, I'm very sorry. Um, well, I think that uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot deploy international forces uh, because first they will not go there. Uh, uh, um, you know, the, the international community is, uh, is uh, overstretched. Today they have forces in Iraq, they have forces in, uh, in Afghanistan, they have forces in Kosovo, in the Balkan uh, area, in, in Africa, and they don't suffer from an excess of uh, troops to send. This is one reason. Another is, and this is the most important reason, you cannot have, a, a, and of course Lebanon, we have, there are 15,000 in Lebanon, you cannot have an international force deployed when there is no pol accepted political framework. You need, you need a, a, a political framework within which they can operate. Uh, of course, if there is a ceasefire and there is a process that is agreed by the parties, what does it mean? And the parties have, are, are committed to that, you will have an international force. Or the, there is a chance to have an international force. Otherwise, I think it is better to maintain the situation that the Egyptians control the southern outskirts of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Philadelphia. Because, why? Not because the international community wants them, but because it is an interest, uh, a vital interest for the Egyptians. Uh, form, former Foreign Minister Benami and Daniel Levy, thank you both very much for being here. I want to thank our, our uh, attendees this morning, our viewers online. And uh, uh, I, I guess I remain slightly hopeful, uh, uh, as much as I don't believe, but I very much appreciate your thoughtful approach to thinking about the ceasefire, about the Annapolis summit, and particularly about the regional dynamics and the co political context in which these issues are being discussed. I think this was a, a fabulous discussion. I want to thank everyone for their, for their patience with the questions as well. So thank you. I want to thank uh, our staff, Samir, Dan and Millet, uh, and the others. And I need to apologize for Daniel and Shlomo Benami, who are going to rush to Capitol Hill immediately. Uh, so uh, uh, but thanks, everyone.